We thought it'd be useful just to start with a little bit of background. Um, I'm Sarah Knight, I'm Head of Learning and Teaching Transformation in our Higher Education and Research Directorate at JISC. So we have a responsibility for working with universities across the UK and supporting them with using technology effectively in education. We work also with further education and we have partners uh, with our sort of key British sector bodies who are working in, in higher education and further education as well. We are funded by our funding councils within, within the United Kingdom. Um, and you'll see there from that map, we support uh, England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. Um, Helen, if we move on to the next slide, thank you. And this, this just shows a little bit of background in relation to the number of, of uh, staff we have working within JISC and the number of organisations that we support. Um, you'll see there as well, we cover research and we have uh, an income um, of uh, nearly 240 million pounds, which we use in terms of supporting the services that we provide to the further and higher education community. And if we move on to the next slide, Helen, uh, this gives us a little bit more background. And some of you may have heard about Janet, which is the network that we provide to all UK universities and colleges to support them with accessing the internet. And we also provide services in these areas. So we have a large amount of work going on at the moment in relation to connectivity and cybersecurity and cloud. We provide uh, resources and collections of resources to universities and colleges. We are developing services in supporting universities with their data analytics and business intelligence. And we are doing work and research uh, in the areas of open research, student experience, which we're going to be hearing more about today, and verification services. So that gives a little insight into the very broad range and the work we're going to be focusing on today falls within our digital transformation program of activities. So within that, we are working with universities to take forward some of the challenges um, that they are receiving from the pandemic. So looking further into how to develop the curriculum, how to redesign assessment, looking at learning spaces, um, and importantly, bringing that all together to recognise that if we are moving forward with digital transformation agenda, we need to be working across the university. So this is where we get into the session uh, that we're going to be hearing more about from Helen in a moment. And we recognise post pandemic that, sorry, Helen, just to go back very briefly, thank you. We recognised that we needed to be exploring how universities were redefining and redeveloping the curriculum post pandemic. We undertook a literature review of current practice, and we also surveyed our universities to hear what they were doing in terms of supporting staff with learning and curriculum design. And within there, we discovered nearly 30 uh, different models that were being used. And that uh, we go into more depth in the publication, which you'll see a link on the screen, and I will pop that into the chat uh, shortly. Um, we also have a podcast, so if you are interested in following this presentation, you may like to listen to the podcast, uh, which Helen and Sheila McNeil, who co-wrote the publication, uh, will share more about their work and forms the basis of the work we're currently undertaking. So if we move on to the next slide, Helen. So we thought it would be useful, uh, before I hand over to Helen, just to share some definitions and aware that uh, when we talk about curriculum and learning design, you'll probably have your own definitions. And I know you're going to be exploring that further during the course of today. Um, but for us, it was helpful to identify and define uh, and distinguish between the two definitions, although recognizing that in many cases, those terms can be used interchangeably. So for curriculum design, we're looking at the reviewing, planning and developing a course of study. And for learning design, looking at how learning will be supported within each course module or unit. And we'll say a little bit more about how that, uh, how that works in practice in the next few slides. 
when uh, Helen talks about our phase two work. But when we're talking about those, those terms, we are meaning all the processes of planning um, and implementing developing a course of study and how students will learn. So at this point, Helen, I'm going to hand over to you to take us through uh, our next phase of work. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you for your patience with my handling of the slides. So I think, as Sarah said, these definitions are not hard and fast. We found them being used very interchangeably within the UK. And I think the whole space of curriculum and learning design is quite a complex one. I'm sure you find the same thing. But what we're talking about is how decisions are made and then realized and interactions are developed within uh, learning and teaching. So at the very high level, which you could call the macro curriculum, we think about those overarching principles, why this, this subject should be learned, what skills students will gain. And in the UK, we have to interface with subject bodies and professional bodies who determine quite large parts of the curriculum in university settings. And also we think about the overall learning environment that we're providing the campus, campus spaces, the learning platforms that the university invests in. And then at this middle level, which in the UK is often uh, a quite a formal committee based decision making process, we think about how we translate that into sessions of learning, maybe lectures, practicals, seminars, into assignments, um, and into cohort groups that will learn together, that will interact together. And then finally, sometimes at the point of delivery, we think about um, exactly what activities students are engaged with moment to moment, what tools they're using, um, what spaces we create, perhaps a little breakout room, perhaps um, a small paired study, perhaps a report back from a project. And a lot of this is decided in the moment um, as we're teaching. But of course, we hope that design decisions are not one way, that also there's feedback and evaluation, which is informing the future design decisions so that we are learning about how this is in the classroom. I'm sure in Germany, you have also been talking about AI tools for student writing, things like chat GBT, which you could see as um, quite a low level decision. What tool will I use for this writing project? But of course it has implications that come all the way back through what assignments should we design for students and all the way back to what are the principles on which we ask students to write? So small things at the level of an activity or a tool could have a large implication for the curriculum. So Sarah mentioned that we talked about what we'd learned in the pandemic. Um, this was not only the pandemic that created this shift, but in the UK, we have certainly noticed a shift from a focus on learning design, activity design, materials, um, digital tools, and towards thinking about the whole way that students interact, whether that's um, using an online video room like we're using now, or thinking about how the time of the curriculum might be changed, for example, by having recorded lectures, which means that the whole time in which students learn might be compressed, it might be shifted, time shifted, they might repeat bits of the curriculum, so we're having to think again about the time and the space of the curriculum and about the whole way that we assess. And I'm sure in Germany you found that some of this has led to larger thoughts and decisions about what sort of campus we have, what kind of rooms we need, how they're equipped, what the workload model is for staff and students, how much time staff spend on different activities in teaching and how much time students spend on different activities. And I think there's probably more um, teacher-led learning. So teachers have learned in the pandemic. I know from working with teachers that online spaces like this one and um, embodied physical spaces are very different 
So even though this seems like a space we're all meeting together and encountering each other, in fact, the ways that we interact will be very different. Our use of eye contact, what we know about each other's uh, mood, um, things that teachers do in the classroom very naturally with space and with their bodies, you have to be more planful and explicit about online. Now we're going into groups. These are the groups you'll go into. It has to all be done much more carefully and explicitly. And so this means that different learning activities have different meanings. And you will all have noticed that different students are more or less comfortable with the online or the face-to-face -face environment, with the speed, with the responsiveness, with the social cues. And some of this is really positive because we've found that the rules of the classroom, the power dynamics can be talked about and maybe renegotiated. So I think the one insight that we have been um, working on, Sheila and I, in this second phase of work is that what this means is all learning is hybrid. Even when learners are in the classroom, they might be using their technology as a screen to somewhere else. They could access another place, another uh, piece of content, another conversation, another environment while they're in the room. They can connect their learning in time and they can use their time differently. They can stretch their time, they can constrain their time, they can repeat, um, they can change and shift times at the time that they do things in. What combinations of time and space are going to work for different students? What combinations of the time to reflect, slow time, and the time to respond and react and collaborate, faster time, which combinations work better for different students, for different activities and for different subject areas? What are the new rules and norms that we have to negotiate? And also what choices should students have? Because students, in the UK have become very used to choice. Shall I attend in my nightwear, you know, with my camera off? Shall I bother to get on the tram or the bus and go to my lecture? And those individual choices have an impact on what the whole class feels like. So we've begun to develop some little posters that express some of this complexity. So this one is about a student who is physically in the lecture hall. But at the same time, at the same time, they're also checking links online. They're perhaps answering a quiz like you just did with Mentimeter. Maybe they're looking at their social media. Maybe they're asking their friends. I was just saying to, to, saying to Sarah, where are you? Are you okay? Perhaps they're connecting. Did you understand that? I didn't get that piece. Um, perhaps they're taking notes and saving those notes to another space which is their personal learning environment. And we have a whole series of posters like this to express some of these complexities. So this model is in the report. Um, so I won't go into it in a great deal of detail. It's not um, meant to be um, a prescription for how you should do it. It's more of a description of what we found when we looked at 30 different models that were being used. But what we found is that um, there is a kind of uh, an overarching process and the, the pink red box is the information that comes into that process, the constraints, the professional standards, perhaps the uh, decisions already made by your university about what environment you will use, what the campus looks like. And then in the yellow orange part are the decisions that you can make and what Sheila and I and Sarah are producing is forms of decision support. So we can help people to make those decisions and we can help the decisions that are made in the classroom to be meaningful when it comes to the decisions about which platforms to buy or which spaces to design or what furniture to put in there. So hopefully there's dialogue between the two. And then the green part is the uh, forms that those decisions are communicated to students especially so there would be in the UK a course handbook but also there would be a timetable that says to students these are the times you will be learning together here are the times you'll be learning on your own here are the spaces you must come to 
Here are the online spaces we will provide for you. And here are the different ways you will work with each other, with materials, perhaps with um, practical classes and, and the things that will come together for you. So we've been trying to think about that in terms of these issues of time and place and mode of participating by which we mean um, whether it's online or offline or mixed and how it's mixed and coming up with uh, decision support around these three areas. So decision support around different sessions you might design for your students. What demands do they make on staff time and student time? How do people feel in an online session compared to an embodied session? Um, what kinds of, if you have, for example, a very challenging debate with difficult concepts and ideas, maybe it's good to be in the room together so that people can learn from each other's body language, you know, and can um, adjust what they're saying. If you have something that is very content rich, maybe you should make uh, some short videos students can watch them and then you can come together in a live classroom and discuss what was difficult what was challenging what do we need to go over in more detail the curriculum because it is in these different times and different spaces has to be brought together by students and that's something else we're looking at how do different students make sense of the different times how do they create time for themselves and a schedule for themselves? How do they choose where to be when they are at university? That might be in the library, they might be in a cafe, and what sorts of spaces do they want to be in when they're at university? We have a whole range of materials we're developing to support thinking in these spaces, which I'm really happy to say more about. Um, thinking about different interaction types, different learning sessions that might take place and how we can support students in them. But I think I'll just finish by saying we are developing some principles around time, place and mode. And we very much want to share these and have your feedback. Maybe you have other principles that you have been applying or think should be applied. Uh, so I'll just go through them one at a time. So the first principle, which we really learned from the pandemic is that bodies are always somewhere. So when your students are online, they still have a body and their body might be um, in a cafe, it might be in their study bedroom, it might be on campus somewhere in the library. And we have a question about how responsible universities should be for their students' bodies when their students are online, because students still need to be safe, private, well they still need access to services many students are now living a long way away from campus um, how are they looked after when we're teaching online and so it's thinking about well-being of the student even when we are working with them at a distance and perhaps all we see is the the face on the screen you know where are they and how are they and how are we thinking about that in our in our designs but presence can always be somewhere else. So when our students are physically in front of us, they can be somewhere else. They might be in a different space. We can direct and guide them to somewhere else. Maybe we want them to do a task. Maybe we want them to collaborate in an online group, answer a question. Perhaps we can guide their attention, but they will also take their attention to other places, whether we guide them or not. So we need to be aware of the consequences of presence being distributed. The time and attention are still finite. Whatever technology we use, there's only so much time, there's only so much teacher work, there's only so much student attention, and we have to think about how we distribute it through the curriculum. But even given all of that, students want some choice over how they participate now. They want to be able to choose and be flexible about how they manage their times and their spaces. And so I think the overarching thing is that students will need some more support to make sense of this. We tend to assume that students know how to use their digital devices to knit together, to bring together a curriculum experience. But actually, they need quite a lot of guidance to do that well, to know how to study, how to manage their time and attention, 
how to be in places that are supportive for them and the kind of learning they want to do. So I'll pass back to Sarah for the last slide, but hopefully there's time for us both to answer some questions. Thank you, Helen. And yes, we, we really welcome opportunities. I, I have been responding to a few of the, the comments in the chat and really welcome the opportunity of hearing your comments, your reflections, and also importantly, how you are approaching this in, in your context, in your universities. Thank you, Helen. And hand over to you, Stefan, for any comments and questions. 